Hello, my name is Eric Gracie. I'm the FM Group Manager for the Center for Forest and Wood Certification at the University of Kentucky. The following presentation is to provide education and outreach to loggers and forest industry workers to improve the awareness of the high conservation value of the Central Appalachian Critical Biodiversity Area. Uh, the presentation is also designed to improve the BMP implementation uh, in an effort to mitigate the threats identified uh, by the FSC U.S. Controlled Wood National Risk Assessment. The Central Appalachian CBA is the area shaded on the map. Um, the map can be downloaded and printed off at the web address that's provided at the bottom of the map. I would recommend everyone do that. Um, as you can see from the, uh, from the highlighted areas, that the CBA did not follow, follow county lines. Therefore, portions of the county you may be working in may be in the CBA and other portions may not be. Um, a general rule of thumb is if you're uncertain, if you're working in the CBA area, is to consider that you are working in the CBA and operate uh, your logging operation accordingly. High conservation values in FSC, um, are areas of biological, ecological, social, and cultural importance. FSC is trying to ensure that their system helps to uh, maintain and protect these areas. So why is the Central Appalachian CBA and HCV? The area meets the critical uh, definition for biological and ecological importance. The forests are significant uh, due to their uh, a high diversity in tree species, understory species, and uh, the wildlife and plant species. The area is also home to uh, the most diverse temperate freshwater ecosystems in the world. Threats to the Central Appalachian CBA were uh, identified in the risk assessment and forest management activities themselves were not considered a threat However, forest management activities were identified as a threat to the aquatic habitats. Specific concerns was conversion from hardwoods to planted pines, and um, it was mainly due to the associated ditching that can take place uh, with this activity, and that ditching leading to sedimentation and uh, degradation of the aquatic habitats. Loss of near stream forested habitat, sedimentation associated with logging, lack of BMP implementation, and riverbank erosion. So those were the five uh, main concerns that were identified in the uh, risk assessment. So addressing those concerns, um, if, you're, if you're working in an area where there's uh, the management objective is to convert the hardwoods to planted pines and there's associated ditching in those wetter areas, uh, it would be best just to, uh, to uh, not try to claim controlled wood uh, for those harvested. Loss of near stream forested habitat. Uh, this can easily be resolved or addressed through SMZs. Depending on the state of the harvest, uh, SMZ widths and cutting guidelines may vary. Um, in Kentucky, we have mandated SMZs and mandated BMPs. Uh, but the easiest way to look at it is if you're looking at controlled wood, you uh, have to implement an SMZ regardless if it's uh, regulated or voluntary in your state. Examples, uh, here's an example of Kentucky's SMZ requirements uh, for, uh, for perennial streams. Roads, trails, and landings uh, need to be at least 100 feet away for slopes greater than 16%. Uh, and you need tree buffer canopy of 50 feet and 50% 50 of the overstory must remain. Um, for lower slopes, the distance for roads, trails, and landings re is reduced to um, 50 feet. The tree buffer is 25 feet. And uh, once again, 50% of the overstory must remain. Um, on intermittent streams, uh, there are there's not an overstory retention. Uh, the minimum distance 
for roads, trails, and landings mirrors that of perennial streams. So 50 feet for lower slopes, 100 feet for steeper ground. Exceptional use waters require special SMZs. Um, special use waters are typically cold water aquatic habitats, com commonly referred to as trout streams. Outstanding state resource waters. These are high quality waters that are periodically monitored. Uh, they provide baseline data and are normally uh, the uh, used to determine how impaired other waterways are in the area. Outstanding state resource waters with T&E listed species. So these are going to be streams and rivers that contain federally listed um, species. Uh, oftentimes you'll have both an outstanding state uh, uh, resource water and aquatic uh, cold water aquatic habitat on that stream. This slide shows an example of Kentucky's uh, SMZ requirements for exceptional use waters. Um, the road and trail and landing buffer is 100 feet regardless of slope. The tree buffer is also 100 feet regardless of slope. And the big, uh, big difference is, is the overstory retention has to remain at 75% or higher. So because of these, uh, this overstory retention requirements, it's pretty important that you know if you're operating within a uh, exceptional use water so you can implement the correct SMZ. Okay, picking up from the PowerPoint, uh, this short video is going to go through the process of using the interactive uh, stream maps to determine uh, if the stream that you're working in has been designated as exceptional use. Uh, we provided the, the easiest way in Kentucky, and I'm going to use Kentucky as an example, is to go through the Kentucky Master Logger website. Uh, the link's provided in the PowerPoint. You can also copy and paste this into your web browser or Google Kentucky Master Logger. I'm going to click on the link. That's going to take us to the, the Master Logger homepage. Once on the homepage, we'll scroll down to about the middle of the page. Uh, there's a section that says water maps, how to find protected streams. Click on the link there. And that will take us to the uh, Kentucky water maps. Um, in Kentucky, they have gone through and color coded all the streams that have exceptional use. This is a little different than some of the other states that have uh, interactive maps. Uh, what you would see in those is all the streams would just be uh, you know, blue, blue streams, and uh, you would have to click on each stream to get its uh, designation. So Kentucky's kind of shortcutted that to a certain degree, and they've color-coded the streams by their different exceptional uses. Um, so to find out what those exceptional uses are, we're gonna need to pull up the legend. Um, the same thing is gonna be happening will happen if you're working in the other states uh, that are not color-coded. You're going to want to find that legend so you'll know the terminology that they're using and what it correlates to. Um, I'm going to click on the, the legend, slide it over here out of the way. So each stream that has a des special uh, exceptional use has been color-coded. For example, the purple um, stream is it's a cold water aquatic habitat, outstanding state resource water. If you want to, uh, on the sides, you'll see a plus and minus. This is how you zoom in and zoom out. So we're gonna zoom in to an area. Um, we still don't have the names of these streams. Um, the, what you can do is uh, take your pointer, and this is what you would do in the other states' interactive websites, is you put your pointer over top of this stream, click on it, and it will give you the name, and it's Martin's Fork in this case. It's cold water aquatic habitat, outstanding resource water. So it correlates exactly to the legend. In Kentucky, the legend also includes uh, 
water bodies besides just streams uh, that have any type of, of uh, designation as well as uh, shows the wild rivers that we have in the state. So the, the green correlates with the Cumberland River while it's, and its wild river designation. You just can scroll around in your areas just uh, with your mouse um, and uh, get to any area that you would need to. This, all these maps work the same way, regardless of the state. Um, in the states that don't make it quite as easy to find, um, if it were me, I would go through and uh, go through this process. And if you have an area that you consistently are working in, would click on the streams and make a list of the streams that have uh, uh, exceptional use designation uh, and uh, just keep that on hand and you can cross-reference that when you're looking at uh, starting a timber harvest or, or what have you. That will conclude uh, the video. Hopefully it will help folks navigate their way through these interactive maps. So the following is a list of the other counties in the uh, uh, CBA area, um, the other states, I should say, that where you can find the uh, exceptional use waterways in Alabama. It's a, lip, a list of protected waterways at the Department of Environmental Management. Um, for Georgia, um, it is actually, you go to their Fish and Wildlife uh, website and it's an interactive map and it, it shows the cold water aquatic habitats. For other exceptional use streams, you'll want to contact the uh, the local Georgia Environmental Protection Division. Uh, in North Carolina, it's an interactive map very similar to uh, the one I demonstrated in the video for Kentucky. Uh, Tennessee is a database uh, search, so what you'll need to know is the name of the stream that you're working on or working in, and you'll enter that stream into their database and it will provide you any information on that stream. Um, Virginia, it's an interactive map, similar to Kentucky's. And in West Virginia, uh, you'll go to the West Virginia uh, Department of Environmental Protection website and uh, click on the tier three stream list and that will provide a list of all the tier three streams. Um, and that's what they're using as a, the tier three streams are exceptional use waters in, in West Virginia. So the final three concerns that were uh, uh, identified in the risk assessment were sedimentation, riverbank erosion, and lack of BMP implementation. All three concerns can be addressed with BMP implementation. FSC's uh, concern in central in the central apple and latch and CBA is you're likely going to be harvesting in steep terrain, and which increases the likelihood of sedimentation and getting back at protecting those aquatic habitats. Um, so BMP implementation must be implemented for controlled wood claims, regardless if the state has mandatory BMPs or voluntary BMPs. So some things to focus on. I'm not going to go back through and address everything that was uh, that you guys were uh, learned in your state BMP program, similar to the Kentucky Master Logger Program and the other states equivalent to the, those programs. But I do want to talk about some things to focus on that will uh, greatly reduce uh, sedimentation and uh, aquatic issues coming from uh, your forest management or your harvesting jobs. Stream crossings. Where feasible, use elevated stream crossings. Almost everyone uh, should be familiar with bridges, uh, culverts, uh, pol and pole crossings. Uh, if you've attended the Kentucky Master Logger Program, you should be as familiar with the pipe bundle as well. Um, okay, this uh, slide shows the pipe bundle for those that aren't familiar with it. Um, the picture on the upper left is uh, shows the pipe bundle itself. It is a 15 foot a schedule 44 inch PVC pipe uh, and to cut down on the weight, every other pipe has been uh, cut in four foot sections. 
And the key to this is when you install it, it's similar to installing a culvert you laid in the creek channel and that photo is showing on the far right. And you'll want to put a tarp or a piece of geotex over top of the pipe bundle and then put your fill on top. What this does is a couple of things. It, uh, it, when you're removing the pipe bundle, uh, when you're finished with the operation, it uh, helps uh, keep some of the fill material out of the creek, but it also prevents uh, rocks primarily and gravel from getting down into the pipe bundle and that the rocks combined with the weight of the skitter will, uh, will break the uh, pipes. But if you put the, the, the uh, geotext or, or tarp down, then that prevents the rocks from getting in there. And of course, the middle picture is just um, uh, a pipe bundle that's being used and it, they're tougher than you think. They don't fail. Um, and you can even get a few cracked pipes and stuff and the pipe bundles will still hold up. So, uh, you know, there's always some doubt with the first time you see that they'll never hold up, but they actually hold up uh, relatively well. Other things to do is to minimize the use of soil around culverts. Um, and do not put soil on the channel for bridge support. So the far, the picture on the left, it just shows some uh, crane mats uh, and to reduce the span, they put in some additional pa uh, crane mat and some blocking and that's uh, providing the bridge support. Uh, the picture on the, uh, on the right course correlates with stabilizing the uh, disturbed ground um, as soon as possible. So this uh, culvert crossing is still in use, but as you can see, they've went ahead and put straw and seeded that site to get it stabilized uh, as soon as they can. Uh, this uh, slide is, uh, and it really demonstrates just how effective elevated crossings are. There was a uh, BMP and SMZ stream study at the University of Kentucky Robinson Forest, and they looked at uh, uh, four different types of crossings, a ford, a culvert crossing, a pipe bundle crossing, and a bridge. Uh, and they measured the amount of uh, total suspended sediment um, at those crossing locations, depending on what the operational phase was. So at installation, uh, the ford, you typically gonna have to knock off some banks and kind of make the approaches better. So there was uh, you know, there's a small amount of uh, disturbance created by that culvert or by that Ford crossing installation. Um, and then the culvert was the highest, and that's just with the associated fill that goes along with culverts. Uh, the pipe bundle, you can see by using that uh, uh, fabric on top of the pipe bundle, uh, it reduced the amount of uh, sediment getting into the stream. Um, the easy way to look at these numbers is the higher the numbers, the more uh, mud is getting into the waterway. Um, so at the crossing event, every time the, that ford was used, uh, just a tremendous amount of sediment entered the stream at that crossing versus the three other elevated crossings. Um, the other key thing is uh, rain events that were occurring. So even though that site may not have been active uh, during these rain events, uh, these fords, um, where they'd been disturbed or producing uh, uh, quite a bit of sedimentation um, and uh, removal, getting that forward area dressed back up. Uh, there was uh, a lot of sedimentation compared to the elevated crossings associated with that. So in the end, the, the, the total amount of sediment from the forward crossing versus the three uh, uh, elevated crossings, there's just a tremendous amount of difference. Uh, the high, you know, the, the almost 8,000 uh, milligrams per liter of sedimentation versus the next highest was the culvert at 432. So, I mean, this slide does a really good job of just showing how effective elevated crossings are at reducing sedimentation. So some other things to focus on, roads and trails. Um, Roads and trails are be just behind stream crossings when it comes to uh, contribution to sedimentation coming from logging jobs. You want to minimize grade and you want to minimize the number of roads and trails. It's pretty common sense. If you can do these things, you're going to uh, greatly reduce the uh, 
the amount of mud coming from the roads and trails into the streams. Um, of course, this takes planning. Um, you need to do layout decisions need to be made prior to construction. And uh, once you build them, don't they need to be monitored. Uh, and if you're having issues, they need to be addressed before they turn into problems. So some more things to consider is uh, timing of retirement. Uh, my observation is that uh, it is still common practice for uh, uh, logging contractors to wait until the operation is over and then start uh, installing water bars, seeding, doing the grade work, uh, cleaning out any tops uh, from the stream channels. Um, uh, sedimentation could be greatly reduced if these areas were retired as they were being closed out. So that would just be something that's pretty simple to do that would go a long ways in uh, reducing the uh, uh, sedimentation that's uh, entering these uh, aquatic habitats that FSC is trying to protect. So as you can see, as we went through the BMPs and SMZs, uh, my take home message would be that the state BMPs, when implemented, uh, they work. They're going to mitigate the associated risk with forest management activities in the Central Appalachian uh, CBA. Um, my contact information, if anybody has any questions or comments, uh, is gracie at uky.edu or, or by phone 859-257-0174. Thank you.